1948, um, Israel, the nation state, was uh, invaded in aggressive war by several Arab armies. I'm going to refer here to the Jordanian army that swept across the uh, Jordan River. And in that uh, uh, battle in 1948-49, they resulted in the uh, Jordan and Jordanian army occupying um, the whole of the area from uh, the River Jordan up to parts of Jerusalem. Um, they stayed there until another war of destruction was launched against Israel by the Arabs, including Jordan. Um, but this, instead of it being a war of annihilation against the Jewish state, the Israeli army in the 67 managed to drive the Jordanians back across the River Jordan. One of the places that suffered was Jerusalem, particularly parts of East Jerusalem. Why? Because the Jordanians were unable to continue their advance into West Jerusalem and down the hills to the coastal plain to the Mediterranean. They were stopped in Jerusalem itself. Why this is significant is because at the time they captured the old city of Jerusalem, which had a Jewish majority. One of the first acts they did was to expel, to drive out all the Jews from the old city of Jerusalem and destroy the synagogues, the yeshivot, and uh, they allowed the Arabs to take over the homes and the businesses of the Jews that had been living in the old city of Jerusalem. Part of this was also, was part of the area which is called Shimon HaTzadik and Sheikh Jarrah, in which the Jews fled and the Jordanians took over and allowed the Arabs to occupy the Jewish property, the Jewish homes uh, in, in Sheikh Jarrah uh, or, and uh, Shimon HaTzadik. Uh, I want you, Naomi, to take it from there because today it's become a controversial um, issue here that when the Jewish owners, include personally and also the, the, the companies that own the land and own the properties, are demanding their property back, or to eject the squatters who are living in their homes, or even to come to a settlement in which the Arabs who are living in Jewish homes would pay a nominal rent, the Arabs are even refusing that. So here we have another case of illegal occupation of Jewish homes and Jewish properties and Jewish land by the Arabs. Uh, take it from there so far as the involvement of Regabin. The, the property in question has been owned by Jews for well over 100 years, going back to the Ottoman period when a Jewish um, communal organization purchased the land from Arab owners uh, and divided it into two sections for the Sephardic community and the Ashkenazi community. Be that as it may, part of it was uh, built upon, uh, that's the Shimon HaTzadik neighborhood, and part of it was left undeveloped at the time. Um, there is no dispute that the land deeds are held by this Jewish corporation. There is no dispute that the land deeds have never uh, th there's been an uninterrupted chain of, of possession uh, and ownership since the 1800s, and there has never been a dispute about that. So when the British mandate came in, they established the custodian for enemy or abandoned properties. When the Jordanians occupied Jerusalem uh, and other places, they copied the Ottoman system and created this custodianship. Then the Jordanians did something else. They, rather than be, uh, being a custodian, they transferred property ownership rights from the Jewish owners to Arab owners. Uh, they did this in many, many places, all around Jerusalem uh, and in the outskirts of Jerusalem. So for example, um, the, when there was privately owned property by Jews, they, they did one of two things. They either transferred the title to Arab owners or they uh, declared eminent domain and turned it into Jordanian 
government-owned land, state land. Uh, and so what they did with many of these properties that were owned by Jews privately, and this may surprise some of the listeners to hear, but the, um, the Kalandia refugee camp, the Anata refugee camp, the Dehesha refugee camp are all built on land that was privately owned by Jews, land from which the Jewish owners were ethnically cleansed, banished, and their property rights denied by the Jordanian occupation. So the Jordanian government uh, built these uh, places to house the refugees and abrogated the property rights of the Jews. Now, had the, the Jordanians done the same thing for the properties in the Shimon Hatzadik neighborhood, there would be no question, as there is no question today, that Jews cannot claim, reclaim their property rights in these areas. But the Jordanians did not do that in the Shimon Hatzadik neighborhood. What they did was they leased, they, they made an arrangement with the United Nations, UNRWA, um, to build housing for certain displaced uh, Arab families. And the United Nations built these properties and rented the apartments to these Arab families under one condition. They were given a three month trial period at first, and then the leases were extended several times, um, they had to pay rent. And if they didn't pay rent, they would be turned out immediately. So when the Israelis resumed uh, control jurisdiction in 1967, they did precisely what the Jordanians did, but they did it a lot better. What they did was they created this custodianship for abandoned or enemy properties, and the custodianship returned to any land that had not been uh, that, that the title had not been transferred by the Jordanians to its rightful owners. That means that if the Jordanians decided a piece of land would now no longer be owned by Jews and they gave the title legally to an Arab, the, the, even though the Jordanian occupation was illegal and not internationally recognized, the state of Israel for legal purposes said, we will respect the decisions of the Jordanian custodian and the Jews can no longer reclaim rights to this land. Neither the Jews nor the Arabs who had had their properties, um, let's say, taken over by the Jordanian occupation could any longer reclaim those rights. However, anything that wasn't transferred to a different ownership uh, by the Jordanians, the original owners, both Jews and Arabs, could come to the custodian, show their uh, proof of ownership, and have their rights of ownership reinstated. And that's precisely what happened with the properties in what's now known as Sheikh Jarrah. And the renters of these properties then had to pay their rent rather than to the Jordanian government, they had to pay it to the owners of the properties. And they did so for a certain amount of time. And they, went to, they stopped paying, and some of them this is already their heirs, their children, and in some cases, grandchildren. Um, they, some of them simply stopped paying rent. Some of them moved on and squatters came in instead with no actual uh, connection to the original renters. Uh, and some of them actually severely violated the terms of their rental lease and started either renting or trying to sell these protected properties to other Arab families. So you have a combination of squatters who have absolutely no rights to these properties or um, overstaying renters, people who have not, who have failed to uh, pay their rent for a very long time. The situation went to court uh, back in 1982. This, the Israeli court approved an arrangement in which the renters, the legal renters, were given a special status which is recognized under both British uh, and Jordanian and Israeli law, they're called protected renters. So they were given a very fixed uh, nominal rental fee, and they were given uh, rights to uh, a renter's rights if they continue to pay their rent, uh, that they could not be turned out, neither them nor their uh, descendants. So this was fine until the Palestinian Authority got involved and came to these people and said, 
Stop paying your rent because paying your rent recognizes Jewish ownership and we don't want to do that. So this whole thing became a political issue and became a cause célèbre um, for humanitarian whatever and, and another means of uh, really blackening Israel's name when in fact the state of Israel has no side in this disagreement. It is a, a simple case of renters versus owners of the property uh, and although the state of Israel and the owners themselves have offered incredibly lenient um, and generous uh, packages for uh, resolving the conflict, the Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority and the renters here have refused any compromise. So that's the story in a nutshell. Uh, Regavim is not involved in this case simply because there is no grounds for us to become involved. There are private owners. They have property rights under international law. What the international community is expecting here is for individual property rights of Jewish owners to be ignored or denied simply because they're Jews. And it's an, it's an absurd situation. Anyone who supports uh, the Palestinian Authority's position in this case, clearly uh, has an anti-Jewish bias, I would call it anti-Semitic, but there is absolutely no basis in law for supporting uh, overstaying renters or squatters on privately owned uh, properties for which there has been an uninterrupted chain of ownership dating back to the early 1800s. That's the story of Sheikh Jarrah. Well, there you are, viewers. If you want to get involved, you want to help Israel here, get in contact with Nomi Khan, regavim.org. I want to thank you, Nomi. Thank you very much for being on the show here. I hope we've done something that can help you and your organization, because by doing that, we get the truth and the evidence to people about what's really going on in Israel here. Thank you, Nomi. Thank you. Thanks for hosting. Um, my pleasure. And, and viewers, um, if you're watching this uh, video, if you found it interesting, don't keep it to yourself. Please share, click the like button, click also subscribe, and you will be receiving future video interviews from The View from Israel. This is Barry Shaw saying thank you very much for your support. I'm not